2022's Watcher is a suspenseful and intimate human horror film, depicting a young American woman named Julia as she slowly unravels at the menace of a potential stalker after having recently moved to Romania with her husband Francis. He has work there, but she is reassessing things after an unsuccessful acting career. He is preoccupied with his job and takes every opportunity to unwind and forget about life's troubles while she's living a nightmare. She has a tenuous grip of the language, doesn't have any company most of the day, and fears for her life as there is a serial killer known as the Spider on the loose targeting vulnerable women in their homes. The one constant factor in her terror is the man who seems to be watching her when she least suspects it. This shadowy figure goes on to stalk her throughout her daily exploits, all while maintaining a nefarious brand of plausible denial. Ability. He keeps his distance for the most part, and even when he doesn't, other characters are quick to dismiss Julia's concerns as the machinations of a troubled mind in a foreign land. He's staring right at me. Maybe. Or he's staring at the woman who's staring at him. This is where all the goodwill which was built up by understated performances, tense atmosphere, and a simplistic but gripping narrative begins to sour. Francis is an awful husband, to the point where I both don't know why Julia married him and don't believe in him as a character. He is cartoonishly indifferent to his wife's suffering, imagined or not. She doesn't know what to do with herself now that she's here and is alone and exposed every second he's away. Francis is aware of the spider's infamy in town, but is simultaneously unaware of how severely his presence affects an already disoriented Julia. Couple with that, a police force which is unwilling to or incapable of seeing Julia as a potential victim of a heinous crime, instead opting to treat her and her alleged stalker as equals in the matter, and you realize that the plausibility this plot tried to build on was more structurally compromised than a house of cards in a wind tunnel. Watcher never actually earns the viewer's suspension of disbelief. The dismissive and egalitarian manner with which Francis and the cops treat Julia's mental anguish is a funhouse mirror reflection of what happens in the real world, and is not conducive to getting the audience invested in Francis as a character or the story in general. The opening moments of the film set the tone nicely. A local cab driver delivers Julia an inappropriate compliment, Francis doesn't take kindly to the remark, and Julia has no idea what was said. From the get-go, the film establishes an air of vulnerability as our main character is unable to even perceive what people around her are saying, and their intentions ring unsavory. She is at risk, in more ways than one, and her husband, the one person who should be keenly aware of how jarring this experience must be for Julia, is repeatedly portrayed as negligent and ineffective. I don't believe he's a human being, I don't believe Julia could realistically be abandoned in so many ways throughout the film, and I don't believe the writers even believe that. To step outside the story for a moment, this situation is all too familiar for women across the planet. Feeling unsafe and preyed upon and cast aside are all symptoms of a savage, unforgiving world. One in which evil and brute force have just as good a chance as compassion and justice and where women and children are consistently the victims of these malevolent acts. That is not where I take issue with Watcher, because it lays the groundwork for a true-to-life tragedy, a tale in which a serial killer's victim's cries for help are not heard by those closest to her, resulting in a fatal catastrophe. This story would have been so much more powerful if it had ended here. How the plot was leading us to believe it could and would end, and as a basic understanding of human biology would support. But, for the sake of the message, she magically reaches the gun her neighbor told her about days ago and uses it to kill her stalker, the spider, with Francis as witness, before stepping out into the hallway to deliver this. The final frame of the film. The culmination of 90 minutes of award-worthy character acting and a plot that keeps you guessing at every turn is an expression of death-defying disgust. Please, people, Chekhov's gun is a writing principle, not an ironclad law of the universe. Adhering to it is at best satisfying to the viewer who kept it in mind and at worst a deus ex machina in disguise. How is it possible that she reached that gun in order to be able to shoot the spider? Remember, Lumo. Irina showed her exactly where she kept that pistol earlier in the movie. Yeah, I remember that's not at all what I'm talking about. You see, Lumo, by the time the spider reached the hallway, she would have been able to reach the gun which was only a few feet away from her. Yeah, I can't fault your logic there, but that's not my issue. If you recall, Lumo, Julia does mention she has a background in acting, which is how she was able to bleed out so convincingly. No, I'm quite certain that's not how any of this works. Watcher is by no means the only film to breach believability in order to facilitate a payoff. It's just the most egregious example I've seen in a while. It is a grounded, captivating, tightly written story. Until the very end. This one shot recontextualizes the events of the plot leading up to it and only detracts from the film's quality. 
It is never outright stated by the characters, but Frances treats Julia as though she's suffering from a psychotic break. This interpretation of her experiences is only valid by reading deeper into the story than is necessary. Looking at the film objectively, there is no evidence of an underlying psychological condition or ailment, and all of her concerns are justified by what happens on screen. It's only through the surrounding characters' doubts and gaslighting that Julia is framed as not right in the head. I'm tired of feeling like this because you can't let go of some fucking fantasy. I've said it before, but it bears repeating. Francis is an awful husband. Not the type that engages the viewer in the plot for wanting to see how far he could spiral down into self-destruction or selfish ambition, but rather, the type which shatters suspension of disbelief for lack of even trying to portray a human. He is oblivious and unhelpful to the point that I blame Julia for having married him at all. When Julia is alone, we see her worst fears confirmed. When Julia is in the company of other characters, she's disregarded and treated as the cause of her distress. The film fools you into caring about this world and its stakes and the character's agency therein by crafting a narrative which appears to resemble reality only to drop this bombshell right before the credits roll. The events of the plot were not genuine reflections of realistic characters acting as they authentically would. The plot is jerry-rigged to emotionally torment Julia so that her vindication in the final moments can feel all the more potent. But at what cost? In an instant, the film's climax changes from that of sincere tragedy to a glorified I told you so. I'm gonna screenshot this frame and use it as a reaction sticker whenever my friends didn't believe me about something, because that is what the filmmakers have reduced this face to. A meme. An expression of unbelievable disdain and contempt which she shouldn't even be alive to be able to deliver. It's a miracle she survived having her throat slit, but this is just rubbing salt in the wound. Imagine Jack's soggy, wrinkled old man bod breaching out of the waves beneath Rose to hand her the necklace she cast away at the end of Titanic. Call me hyperbolic all you want. The human body has a few built-in off switches, but Julia's acted like a reset button so that she could give her dopey husband the stink eye one last time. It is incredible, and not in a good way. It's insulting for a story, any story, to leverage our shortened attention spans and emotional investment in characters in order to secure a payoff. What I mean by this is that her shooting the spider and even being able to stand up afterwards is such a slap in the face of the weight of her death just moments prior that it feels as though the writers were hoping we'd forgotten about it. As if placing two shocking events close enough together on a timeline is enough to invalidate the first one in the audience's memory and narrative as well. Not only is Julia's death in this scene poignant and believable, largely owed to the attachment we developed to her over the course of the film, but it is the logical endpoint of her journey. Forsaken, isolated, dismissed, dead. But that's not actually the journey the film aims to depict. Watcher's final shot sends a different message and all but negates the more realistic side of the plot we saw conclude moments ago. Julia's actual journey is that of having her fears and pleas for help invalidated by the very systems intended to support and protect her, only to see those fears realized and then turn the tables on her doubters. A revolutionary, subversive structure to a story which might have only benefited from playing it straight. A tragedy undermined by the themes the people behind the scenes deemed more important. There was such potential here, but this ending skews every preceding event toward the negative. Irina showed Julia her gun, not so that it could be used later on, but because it had to be used later on. Francis and the police didn't ignore Julia because they genuinely believed she was blowing the situation out of proportion, but because she had to prove them wrong in the end. The spider didn't actually outsmart anyone, but everyone around him was made feeble and dim-witted so that he could get away with preying on Julia. This man's plausible deniability relies on other characters disregarding Julia and simply not wanting to engage with her fears in a productive way. He actually has no plausible deniability, because anyone with a functioning brain cell would be able to resolve the situation in three easy steps. Buy drapes, get Julia a gun, and keep her occupied. The threat to her safety is real, so arming herself is the first logical step. But then there's also the fact that she's actively making her suffering worse by bumming around the apartment all day, in clear view of her stalker. Leaving herself unstimulated and idle in an unfamiliar, dangerous environment is only adding fuel to the fire. She's got nothing to do but worry herself about her eventual grisly murder. The good news is, if he ever comes here, if you're a big strong man, I protect you. <laughs> I'm gonna pretend you didn't just laugh at that. This character's name being Francis is no mistake. It is a unisex name which invokes feminine undertones, especially when not in its more masculine form of Frank. He defies the masculine ideal at every opportunity, not taking his fearful wife's words to heart and lashing out with impotent rage when it's convenient for him, not responding proportionately to her cries for help and trying to resolve situations with clinical indifference, ignoring an escalation of tensions and belittling his wife to his friends when he thinks she can't understand him. At least I have the spider to... to keep me company. Is that what you... He is a failure of a husband and a failure of a man. 
a character whose shortcomings are not only integral to Julia's descent into hysteria, but also necessary to facilitate the payoff at the end of the movie. That look of crystallized resent would not mean half as much if all Francis had the spine to help Julia instead of neglecting her. He wears the skin suit of a man and husband, but functions as little more than a tool with which the writers torture Julia. One piece of a set of narrative techniques employed to make her suffer, gratuitously, so that her dramatic triumph in the end is all the more impactful. Well, it would be if we bought into the illusion that this were a story about real people in a believably dangerous place which operates on cause and effect. I'm sounding like a broken record now. I don't want to give anyone the impression that Watcher is a bad film, because it isn't. I would recommend it wholeheartedly to any fan of film or horror in particular, but every such suggestion comes with a massive caveat. The ending. An ending which betrays the stakes and gravity of prior events to give the main character the win she had been deprived up until then. One which sacrifices the emotional weight of a meaningful and tragic death for an unrealistic, unsatisfying, bittersweet and not in a good way look of unfathomable scorn. Is this what we want, as writers and viewers alike? To either unwittingly or maliciously misrepresent our characters and world to feed into a single solipsistic perspective? To ditch the most basic rules of writing tension and drama into our stories to facilitate scathing, resentful payoffs. To hope that viewers' short attention spans will prevent them connecting the dots from earlier scenes in a 90-minute film. To say, yes, I know it doesn't make sense, but that doesn't matter. Because when all else fails, strong actors, indulgent themes, Instagram cinematography, and a shot-in-the-dark plot twist are all it takes to make a good movie.